everyone and welcome to eschatology matters my name is chris barlow you may not be that familiar with me but i do play a very small role in this important ministry um, i am to contribute uh, some content I, I don't get to do that as often as i would like i am a bivocational pastor i have the privilege of serving alongside my co-elder jonathan shelton at the remnant reform baptist church in scottsburg indiana I am hopeful and prayerful that as the Lord uh, affords opportunity, I will be able to contribute a bit more to Eschatology Matters. But I'm very excited to be alongside my good brother from Eschatology Matters, Mr. Ryan Eakins, who's a fellow Reformed Baptist and lover of that beloved confession, the 1689. Ryan, how are you doing this evening, brother? I'm great, Pastor Chris. It's, uh, it's good to be with you once again, even if it's digital. Yes, sir. It's wonderful to see you. Um, we are both very excited to have a very special guest with us for this episode of Eschatology Matters, Dr. Sam Waldron. Dr. Waldron is the pastor of Grace Reformed Baptist Church in Owensboro, Kentucky, where he has served as one of the elders since 2013. He is the president of Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary, also in Owensboro, Kentucky. Uh, he is the professor of systematic theology. He's the author of several books three of which are on the topic of eschatology, and a fourth one soon to come. Uh, he's a follower of Christ, which is his most important role. He's a husband, his second most important role. And he's a father and a grandfather, his third most important role. Dr. Waldron, you're a very busy man, and so we are very grateful and excited that you've uh, agreed to take some time out of your busy schedule to, to spend this evening with, with us. Well, it's great to be with you, and I'm with you because I do believe that eschatology matters. <laughs> Amen. And uh, yeah, I'll just uh, footnote your introduction by saying, yes, I'm a father of uh, four, uh, uh, four children, and I have 15 grandchildren, and very thankful for God's mercy to my children in that way. Amen. Praise God. Yes. I do want to say to both of you and to our viewers and listeners that today is October 31st. So before we go any further, happy Reformation Day to everyone out there. Dr. Waldron, what can you tell us that is new in your life and in your ministry? Well, um, I'm uh, on the verge of uh, trying to identify the right publisher for a new book on eschatology. Uh, which I've tentatively entitled The Doctrine of Last Things, an Optimistic Amillennial View. Uh, I've been teaching eschatology, as you know, for a long time, and uh, at least once or twice a year over the last 20 years, I think, in different places and affiliates of our seminary. And um, that's led me to uh, refine my understanding of how it ought to be presented. And uh, well, my understanding of eschatology is kind of broken up between end times made simple, more of the end times made simple, and MacArthur's Millennial Manifesto. And being a systematician, I'm very unhappy with that fragmented character. So I, I, I'm i looking forward to publishing uh, The Doctrine of Last Things, which I, I hope and think I've dealt with it in a more systematic and I hope ironic, but still very clear way. Well, Dr. Walter and I know Ryan and I both are very excited about that book. We look forward to it. We do have your End Times Made Simple, more of the End Times Made Simple, and your MacArthur's uh, Millennial <laughs> Manifesto. So we look forward to the Doctrine of the Last Things and optimistic amillennial view. Along those lines, there's an important conference coming up in the spring. I, I want to, if we have time, talk a little yeah. bit more in detail about that. But can you ju just give us a brief overview of what that conference is going to look like? Oh, yeah, we're really excited. Um, uh, March 14 to 16 in LaGrange, Kentucky. I guess it's at, I guess the name of the church is LaGrange Baptist Church. It's uh, the church where Dr. Tom Nettles is a member. Uh, we're going to hold our third annual Coven CovCon or Covenant Conference. It's our seminary conference. And this year it's uh, on the subject of conquering and to conquer. And uh, I have... Uh, 
two great amillennial brothers were there with me to preach on that subject. Uh, Vaughty Bauckham is going to be there to preach uh, several times. Uh, Joel Beakey is going to be there several times to preach. I'll be preaching a couple of or three times, and a couple of other brothers, our vice president, John Miller, will be preaching as well. We're really looking forward to that. The um, the uh, uh, registrations are going crazy right now. Uh, I'm sure that's because uh, the names Bauckham and Beakey draw more than Waldron. But anyway, I'm very excited about the possibility, uh, the possibilities of God blessing that con conference in a wonderful way. Hey Amen. I, I have had the privilege, the blessed opportunity to attend uh, both of the first two conferences and, and was extremely blessed by them. I'm looking forward to this conference in the spring. Well, brothers, before the time gets too far away from us, why don't we dig in? But before we even do that, Ryan, would you mind opening us up in a word of prayer? Sure. Let's pray. God, you are the one true God and you deserve all the praise in heaven and on earth. Uh, God, we are, we are sinners. And if it were not for your grace, uh, we would never, we would never worship you. We would never give you the praise that's due your name. And so we thank you for that amazing and special grace that you have reached down and turned sinners towards you. Hmm. God, we thank you for that. We thank you also uh, that uh, the gospel includes uh, you saving a people that you have planned uh, from before the foundation of the world. And it, it culminates in what you will continue to do as you build your church. Uh, God, we pray for uh, wisdom and guidance as we as we discuss uh, eschatology, um, and we keep it connected to the gospel. Uh, hey, thank bye. you for Dr. Waldron, his willingness to uh, to be with us, um, and we we pray that you will bless our conversation and make it profitable and charitable. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. All right, Dr. Waldron, are you ready to go? I'm ready, sir. At least hey, we're going to get right after it. Um, must every self-respecting Calvinist be a premillennialist? Uh, <clears throat> no, and most of them haven't been. Uh, <laughs> Amen. Uh, and and uh, uh, I think Augustine would have been surprised uh, about this. Uh, he's, of course, acknowledged as, uh, in some way, uh, the epitome in the early church and of... of uh, a great step forward in terms of the development of theological understanding of the church, uh, and uh, for and his great semi-Pelagian uh, uh, treatises in which he refuted semi-Pelagianism, taught the doctrines of grace uh, really clearly, and so uh, uh, the the first Calvinist, if we can talk historically in a, in a certain way, uh, the first Calvinist historically. Uh, Augustine himself was not a premillennialist, and in fact, uh, you go read uh, chapter 19 of the City of God, and you'll see very clearly that uh, he, he had rejected premillennialism and become a non-millennialist when he wrote that book. And in that book, there are many other statements that support mm -hmm. the sovereignty of God and the doctrines of grace at the same time as he presents premillennialism. So, uh, no, I don't. I don't see. Uh, I don't see where our dear brother John MacArthur is coming from, or uh, how that can be defended, uh, either uh, either theologically or historically. Quite honestly, yes, I would. I would agree. I, I will tell you, Doctor Waldron, that I I know this is this is nothing new. Um, I'm new to to discovering this. I I read his sermon. I believe the sermon was preached at the 2007. Shep mm -hmm. but I, I read his sermon for the first time about seven or eight years ago. Uh, uh, re read it recently within the last two or three years ago. And uh, during that course of time, my pre pre my view of eschatology, excuse me, had been changed through what I had saw in the scriptures. Um, and the second time I had read it, I, I was nearly offended by some of the things that, <laughs> that he was uh, proclaiming and had a trouble 
lay my head down on my pillow at night with any sort of integrity. So it's refreshing to hear you refute that. <laughs> and I, I've read your MacArthur's Millennial Manifesto. Most certainly appreciate your work. But in reading his sermon, going through his sermon, he raises a few questions that I also want to post to you to see how you sure. respond. Was sure. Jesus an amillennial? Was who? Jesus. Was Jesus an amillennial? Yes, I, I think that's pretty clear. Luke 20, verses 34 to 36, uh, makes this great and drastic contrast between uh, this age and the age to come. Jesus teaches that this age is characterized by people marrying and given in marriage. The age to come is, in the age to come, people do not marry. This age is characterized by death and dying. In the age to come, people do not die. Go read Luke 20, 34 to 36. This age is characterized by a mixture of good and evil men, but only righteous men inhabit uh, the world age to come. And then finally, this age is, is inhabited by natural men, but Jesus teaches clearly there that the age to come is inhabited only by uh, resurrected men. And, and so if you go read Luke 20, 34 to 36, I often say, that I base my eschatology not on Revelation 20, although I think Revelation 20 supports my eschatology. I base my eschatology on Luke 20. And, and the reason that Luke 20 must be given priority here is that, uh, is that uh, uh, it is stated in very clear, straightforward, prosaic kind of language. And though Revelation 20, I think, supports a non-millennial point of view, it is obviously stated in highly apocalyptic and difficult language to interpret. And so when you take this contrast between this age and the age to come, and uh, you, uh, you read it within the context of Jesus' teaching, for instance, the parable of the wheat and weeds in Matthew 13, it's very clear that this age ends with the second coming of Christ and the resurrection, and the age to come begins with the second coming of Christ and the resurrection. And, um, and if, uh, if a premillennialist has to have both good and evil men in his millennium, if he has to have both resurrected and non-resurrected men in his millennium, and he does, every kind of premillennialism has to have that, then uh, certainly I think we can say that the, uh, the territory and the climate of Luke 20, 34 to 36 is not hospitable to uh, premillennialism. Jesus' teaching is not hospitable to it. What about the apostles? Well, uh, and of course, they were followers of Jesus, so they're a millennial too. But uh, I, I think I think we can. I think one way to uh, kind of just get into this is to challenge our our listeners to go read uh, Paul's treatise on the resurrection, First Corinthians fifteen. And especially verses 20 to 28, it's very clear uh, uh, that Paul, like Jesus, is talking about the fact that the, the kingdom of God comes in two stages. Jesus teaches this in his great parables of the kingdom in Matthew 13, as he contrasts the coming of the kingdom as seed time, as sowing, and the coming of the kingdom as harvest. Uh, and... Uh, Paul uh, adopts the same structure, uh, but he talks about it in terms of the resurrection. And he speaks, of course, of the resurrection of Christ as first fruits, and then the resurrection of his people at his parousia, at his second coming. And uh, it's very clear that once again, we have a two-stage coming of the kingdom. We have the coming of the kingdom in Christ's resurrection, but its consummate coming and the resurrection of Christ's people uh, there at uh, at the second coming of Christ. And, and at that point, the end comes, and the last enemy is destroyed. And uh, and since the premillennialist and every prima kind of premillennialism must have enemies of Christ surviving his second coming and inhabiting the, the reformation of uh, the, the millennium, uh, it's very clear that there's no room in Paul's eschatology, where he states it there in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 28, for instance, there's no room for a millennium after Jesus comes back. 
Amen. There's a third claim that Dr. MacArthur makes in his sermon, and he poses it by asking the question, was the, all, was the Old Testament amillennial? And then he refutes that the Old Testament was amillennial and, and makes the, the statement that it's premillennial. Do you have any comments on that statement? Well, uh, I don't think anybody knows what the Old Testament was without the teaching of the New Testament. Um, the definitive interpretation of the Old Testament is, is the New Testament's interpretation. The Old Testament itself teaches that the prophecies uh, of uh, that that prophetic and uh, prophetic revelation and the prophecies uh, throughout the latter part of the Old Testament uh, are are dark sayings. That's the actual language of Numbers twelve one to eight. When uh, when there's this dispute between Miriam and Aaron and Moses, remember, and uh, and there's this contrast between the kind of revelation that Moses received, face to face, open, objective revelation, and the kind of revelation that uh, 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 Miriam and Aaron, perhaps if they were prophets, and certainly other prophets received. God makes Himself known to them in visions and dreams and dark sayings. So the Old Testament tell, itself teaches us that the prophetic revelation like we have in uh, the prophetic books of the Old Testament are dark sayings. And the New Testament teaches the same thing by telling us that uh, John the Baptist uh, was, uh, was less than the least in the kingdom of God with regard to his understanding of the kingdom. Go read Matthew 11, uh, verses 1 to 14. Ma I, 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 John the Baptist was the greatest, last of the Old Testament prophets. But you remember uh, his understanding of the of his own prophecies and of the other prophecies of the Old Testament led him to question when he found himself rotting in prison while Jesus was teaching that the kingdom had come. Uh, I led him to question if Jesus was the true Messiah. Uh, I think that's the only plausible and proper interpretation of, uh, of his, the doubts that are expressed in, by his mouth there in Matthew 11. The point is that Jesus is teaching there that, uh, that the prophets had a, a kind of view of the future that we can call flattened, that we can call, uh, it's been known as out, in other ways, uh, in uh, the writings of, in, in, in the writings on the Old Testament, it's foreshortened, it's flattened, uh, and they don't have they don't have depth perception with regard to the coming of the kingdom. The whole point of Matthew 13 is for Jesus to say, look, these these and these prophecies of the Old Testament have to be put through the grid of a two-stage coming of the kingdom. The Messiah doesn't just come once, he comes twice. The Messiah of the kingdom doesn't come just once it comes twice the the kingdom of god first comes in a mysterious way that leaves the outward world the field unchanged full of both good and evil men and this was this was a hard saying for uh, john the baptist and of course it would have been a hard saying for jesus disciples this is why he tells us in matthew 13 that the old testament prophecies uh, needed to be interpreted uh, and through a, through the grid of a two-stage coming of the kingdom, a two-phase coming of the kingdom, and only when they're looked at in that way and we understand they're, that, that they're foreshortened, flattened, and lack death perception, uh, can we understand uh, and properly uh, uh, interpret those prophecies. And so this does not mean, um, let me make very clear, that the prophets were wrong, uh, but you see, the prophets gave gave prophecies that came directly from the Holy Spirit through them. And we know that they themselves, read 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12, they themselves had to reflect on what they had said to, to understand it, to interpret it, uh, because the revelation came directly from God. And because of this characteristic of Old Testament prophecy, having this a flat view of the kingdom, this flat view of the coming of the Messiah, uh, not a wrong view, but a view which lacked death perception. What they said was right, but uh, 
well, you find mixed together in Old Testament prophecies, predictions of the uh, of the return of Israel from Babylon, what with the coming of Jesus Christ and his incarnation, with the future second coming of Christ. All these things are are really mixed together in Old Testament prophecy, and and they have to be sorted out to come back to your point. Uh, by a New Testament principle of interpretation. And so, was the Old Testament all millennial? Well, I think according to Jesus and the apostles and the way they interpreted it, it was. But the fact that, uh, that it was dark sayings and needed uh, an interpretation to be really clear on, on the matter of what kind of eschatology we have. Well, thank you for that explanation, Dr. Waldron. Ryan, Dr. Waldron had touched uh, somewhat on Matthew 13 and the parable of the weeds and, and just a little bit of the parables there. Did you have a question for him you wanted to ask? Yeah, he uh, he kind of answered our, our first question away, but uh, I guess kind of as a follow up to uh, to Matthew chapter 13. You know, we've we've heard our post millennial brothers say things like. You know, what kind of a field is it in Matthew chapter 13? Um, <laughs> okay. Does does that does that back the amillennial into a corner? Aye, aye, aye. Why? Uh, no, um, it does not. And, and let me tell you why. Well, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, what kind of a field is it? It's the Lord's field. Of course, it's the Lord's field. And it's a field in which has been planted his wheat. Of course, that's true, too. But it's also a field in which there's there are weeds every place there are weed across the world. So a, uh, that kind of mixture uh, and Jesus' words that explicitly uh, convey that mixture of good and evil men in the world, when he says, let both grow together until the harvest, uh, is entirely consistent with an amillennial point of view. So that's that's one thing I would say. It's it's a mixed field. It's very clearly a mixed field, and that's very clearly the po the whole point of the parable that it's going to remain a mixed field until the harvest, when only the weeds, uh, and only then the weeds are are pulled up. But there's another thing that we can say. Um, amillennialism, I think, should believe, must believe that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached effectively. To all the nations before the end comes, uh, uh, and that it will be if it's preached effectively, there will be churches, gospel churches, throughout the world when the end comes, and um, and and not even uh, okay. So um, I'm going to assume my own, but I think it's the best interpretation of Second Thessalonians two. You know, Second Thessalonians two is often quoted against postmillennialism because it teaches, it, or at least seems to teach to many people, myself included, that uh, just before Christ comes back, uh, there is an apostasy and a revelation of the man of sin. I happen to believe in a personal antichrist. I happen to believe in a concentrated time of tribulation for the church right at the end of this age. I think it's the same thing as the little season at the end of the millennium in Revelation 20. In fact, I think the second Thessalonians 2 and Revelation 20 really beautifully clarify one another. But the point I'm going to make is this, uh, and it struck me in a new way several years ago when I was preaching on second Thessalonians 2. It's this, second Thessalonians 2 teaches that there's going to be a global apostasy. Well, what do you have to have in order to have a global apostasy? You have to have a global church, uh, and uh, and that's what amillennialism teaches is going to happen. That's why uh, uh, that's the heart of what I've called uh, an optimistic uh, an optimistic amillennialism. That no, we don't believe that the gospel is going to destroy uh, destroy wicked men, destroy wicked philosophy, and uh, and bring in a thousand ages of a thousand years of peace age and peace, righteousness, and prosperity, and uh, and that uh, uh, Christian culture and Christian government are going to rule the world. No, we don't believe that. Uh, th at the same time, uh, 
that doesn't mean that the gospel doesn't spread uh, and throughout the world, and that there's not and there's not at 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 the consummation of the age a global church worshiping Jesus Christ, and uh, from which yes there will be apostasy, uh, which again is perfectly consistent with the mixture of wheat and weeds till the end. So, yeah, I I I don't think there's anything. Uh, about I don't I'm not sure where they're going when they say what kind of field is it? It's a field mixed with wheat and weeds. The whole field will be mixed with wheat and weeds. The whole world, which the field is the world, will be mixed with wheat and weeds when Jesus comes back. And that means the gospel is going to be preached effectively throughout the world. Uh, is that going to mean that evil is extirpated? No. Uh, good and evil are going to grow together. The, uh, uh, as evil uh, as good gets better, evil's going to get worse. Uh, I don't, I don't know what that's going to look like. It's bad enough now, but as 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 good grows, so evil will grow, and it's that it's, it's holding that tension that most eschatologies, premillennialism on the one hand, because of its insistence on a kind of pessimistic viewpoint you know, of this age. And postmillennialism, on the other, because of its uh, rose-colored glasses, optim optimism, on the other hand, simply can't hold together. That's the beauty of our millennialism. We can believe what Jesus says is going to be the case, that both will grow together. Good. Yeah, um, moving on to our, to our next topic, Dr. Walden, you've already mentioned about the New Testament helping us with the Old Testament. Yeah. And the, the state the statement has been made that the book of Zechariah is a nightmare for an amillennial. <laughs> How? Well, <yeah>. OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I guess j just just to answer in general, um, does the book of Zechariah teach us that there has to be a future literal thousand year millennial reign? Good night. Why? Um, uh, no, it doesn't. Um, look, let me let me say I've never done any in-depth study of Zechariah 14, and and uh, I have studied Zechariah, but to to sort out all the individual questions that people might have, I want to recommend something. We have a we had a student here at the seminary. He's now a pastor in Oregon. His name is Ben Habegger. Somebody wants to write us. He wrote a wonderful paper on Zechariah 14, in which he sorted a lot of that stuff out. That's the first thing I'll say. The second thing I'll say is, look, uh, Zechariah 14 is is a nightmare. Uh, well, that's that's interesting. The Old Testament teaches that it's a dark saying, and that it's a dark saying that it only can be unraveled in light of New Testament revelation. And as I, I glance through Zechariah 14. Uh, here before the show, I uh, before the podcast, I just noticed that there were passages. There's passage after passage that are is alluded to, not in Revelation 20, but in but in Revelation 21 and 22, and uh, which speaks of the new heavens and new earth, um, and uh, the language of the nations bringing their their uh, riches into it. The language of living water flowing out of Jerusalem. This is language that's picked up and applied to the new heavens and new earth in Revelation 21 and 22. Uh, and uh, and so, no, uh, uh, the only similarity uh, between Nightmare and uh, Zechariah 14 for us is that we do believe it's a dark saying, uh, like the other prophecies of the Old Testament, that has to be illuminated in the light of uh, Jesus' interpretation of the New Testament and the after interpretation of the apostles. Hey Amen. Moving on to our next topic, Dr. Waldron. Um, we're familiar with what's going on in the world stage with Israel and Hamas. Um, in Galatians 6.16, 6, does Paul really refer to the church as the Israel of God? And if that's the case, has the church replaced Israel and is replaced even an appropriate term. <laughs> wow, you managed to sum up about six questions right there, brother. Uh, okay, let me see if I can walk through it one at a time. 
Uh, Galatians 6.16, absolutely Galatians 6.16 refers to the church as the Israel of God. It's indisputable. There's no way that uh, after uh, getting after the Judaizers throughout the entirety of, uh, of Galatians and saying that uh, they uh, uh, are, are requiring circumcision uh, and, and, and saying in Galatians 5, 6, neither circumcision avails any, uh, uh, anything or uncircumcision, but faith that works by love. After saying in Galatians 6, 15, uh, that uh, neither circumcision or uncircumcision matters, but a new creation, that at the end of that book, he's going to create this new group of people that in order to be a member of which you both have to be circumcised and a Christian. And that makes utterly no sense in the context of Galatians at all. So yes, Galatians 6.16 does teach that the church is the Israel of God, uh, just like the rest of the New Testament uh, teaches that Christians are the true Jews, Romans 2, 25 to 28, the Christians are the true circumcision, Philippians 3, 3, that the, that the church uh, and Gentiles included in it are the one olive tree, Romans 11, 25 to 26, and that uh, Gentiles have been brought near and made citizens in the commonwealth of Israel, Ephesians 2, 11 to 19, many other passages we might go to. So, yes, the church is the Israel of God. Um does this mean that the church has replaced Israel? Uh, look, the butterfly doesn't replace the uh, the uh, worm that crawls on the ground. The worm, the uh, the uh, caterpillar, morphs into the butterfly. To say that the butterfly replaces the caterpillar is a misuse of language. You know, I'll I'll tell you a story. Um, when I was uh, doing my doctoral program at Southern, uh, they, I began to hear people talking about replacement theology and supersessionism. I wonder, I said, I wonder, who, I wonder who that is. And then I realized they were talking about me, <laughs> or at least people like me who believe what I believe. And I thought to myself, I don't accept that because I don't think the church replaced Israel. I think the church is Israel, reformed uh, in a new age. Uh, but the church is the uh, is the uh, is the continuation of Israel. And that's what what Paul teaches in Ephesians two eleven to nineteen. Is what he, Paul teaches when he talks about the one olive tree, which is uh, the olive tree is Israel. It's the whole Old Testament background of the imagery. The one olive tree with Jewish branches, uh, some of the Jewish branches broken off, with Gentile branches grafted in. The one olive tree is Israel, and uh, and so we have to uh, we have to say that the church is the con continuation and reformation of Israel. And if this continuation and reformation of Israel, it's not its replacement, and it's not it's not uh, right, except maybe in one of like ten different possible meanings to say it supersedes Israel either. So. Uh, no, uh, I, I reject. Uh, I reject uh, root and branch the characterization of amillennialism as supersessionism or replacement theology. It absolutely is not. What was the? Oh, I know. Now you're asked. Then you wanted me to <laughs> talk about talk about what's going on in the Middle East right now. Well, you know, I, I've been more and more tempted to preach on it. I just. Uh, Sorry, I believe in consecutive expository preaching, and uh, uh, I'm in Second Corinthians five right now, so I don't know quite how to get to it. But uh, maybe I'll just have to take a day off. But <laughs> look, here's the thing: uh, whatever the state of Israel it is, is or is not, it's not the Israel of God. The Church is the Israel of God. Uh, so pray for the per per peace of Jerusalem, i.e., pray for the Church and its and its and its stability and its prosperity. Pray for the peace of the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, the Jerusalem that is above. Um, so, uh, you know, and I I, I understand Romans 11 and all Israel in an amillennial kind of way. I don't believe in this mass conversion of Israelites at the end of the age as the fulfillment of Romans 11. We can talk about that more. 
So uh, I think the key passage with regard to what's happening in uh, in Israel right now, and uh, the the constant the constant battering and uh, persecutions and difficulties of of the ethnic Jewish race. I think what's happening is really the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy in Matthew twenty four. Now, when I say that, when I say that, it sounds like I I I like the I like what's happening. I don't. Or I support what's happening, and again, I don't. Uh, from a political point of view, I think that um, the nation of Israel is probably a lot better than anything else there in the Middle East, and I'm in favor of supporting them, and I don't see how anybody can support Hamas and their atrocities. Uh, Israel, the nation of Israel is not a perfect uh, nation at all, and and nor, nor is there... Uh, a perfect religious liberty there for Christians. But Jesus said in Luke 21, maybe I should read it. Jesus said in Luke 21, uh, these words, and I and I, I think they are still being fulfilled today. <clears throat> um, speaking of the aftermath of the destruction of Jerusalem, and they will be fall, they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Uh, I rather think that we're seeing the ongoing fulfillment uh, of of that that reality, the the judgment of Israel. I'm not saying that we should promote it or be delighted by it or anything like that, what we should do as Christians is preach the gospel to Jews and call them to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it seems to me that the distress that constantly follows the Jewish nation is somehow a fulfillment of Luke 21, 24, and what it predicts will happen until the end of the age with regard to the Jewish nation. So um, uh, I know that's... Uh, there's a lot I'd have to say by way of fleshing that out. Let me emphasize again: uh, if that's God's decretive will, it still doesn't. It's, it, that doesn't. It's not His preceptive will. It's not. It doesn't mean anything like it's something we should want to promote or hasten or or like. Right. So, anyway, uh, I think that's uh, that's uh, the text I would have to bring forward if I was going to preach on what's going on in the Middle East. So I, I could I probably got myself into a ton of trouble by saying that, but that's uh, that's what I think. So what do I think that, here's the one thing I, I think I do know. I think I think uh, Paul in Romans 11 says that there's a remnant uh, according to the election of grace in the Jewish nation and that remnant's going to uh, that remnant's going to continue to be saved in every age and generation till the end of the age until, uh, until all Israel is complete, and that includes both saved uh, rem the the remnant of saved Gentiles and the remnant of saved uh, Jews. Amen. Amen. Ryan, you had a question for Doctor Waldron regarding a candidate spiritual life and how that should influence our voting tendencies. Yes. Yeah, so you know, we, we obviously Christian nationalism is a hot topic now. Um, when when the Christian is thinking about the political sphere, uh, is a is a Christian bound to search for a candidate that appears to have true repentance and follows Christ, or do we simply look for the best candidate? <laughs> well, um, It's hard to know where, on some issues where to begin to to sort them out. Let me let me. Here's where I begin. The United States of America, and no nation on earth right now, is the theocratic kingdom. There was a theocratic kingdom in the past. There will be a theocratic kingdom in the future when Jesus comes back. But between that time, we live in what. I just quoted the text. Jesus calls the times of the Gentiles. 
Every nation on earth, including the United States of America, is a Gentile kingdom. And let's remember uh, that Daniel's pretty clear about what those Gentile kingdoms are going to be like. There will be uh, there will be something about them that's human, something about them that uh, is a means of common grace, but there'll be something about them, and that's Daniel too, there'll be something about them that's bestial and will ultimately give rise to what I think the book of Revelation calls the beast. So, uh, so then... So where does that leave us? Well, it seems to me that the notion that we we have to scrutinize a candidate's uh, Christ, uh, Christian profession and find a, Christ, a Christian man to vote for uh, really uh, stems off of the idea that, that so we're, we're supposed to be some sort of theocracy here. We're not. What, what's, what, what, what kind of principles should we seek to promote uh, uh, in our nation? Uh, um, should we seek a, a, a Christian nation? I don't know how that's consistent with the separation of church and state. I don't know how it's consistent with the whole Baptist history of, of, uh, of believing in religious freedom. I don't think it is consistent with that. I don't think no amount of double talk on their part can make it consistent with that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Gentile kingdoms and every person on earth everywhere is uh, is and ought to be subject to the moral law of God. And uh, and therefore, uh, uh, and especially uh, because we believe in religious freedom, not the first table of the law so much as the second table of the law. And that's, again, good historic Baptist teaching, uh, that it's the second table of the law. And, there, and therefore... I think we need to look for the candidate that will uh, most support, best support, the second table of the law and the implementation of basic human rights in government. Where does that leave me? Well, thou shalt not kill a second table. Therefore, I think we want uh, 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 we want candidates that are pro-life and anti-abortion, right? Uh, and uh, and it, I think we want candidates that uh, are uh, support uh, the the notion uh, of thou shalt not steal, which gets erased in any kind of socialism. So I do think that there are principles that should guide us in terms of who we should uh, uh, search out and and support as our leaders. But we've got to remember before we get into any kind of profession or anyone Christianity, that we're living in a Gentile kingdom, and we've got to have some realism with regard to that. <clears throat> Ryan, did you have a follow-up question on that topic? Or are you ready to move on? Yeah, let's move on. Okay, Dr. Waldron, let's go to the book of Revelation. Um, I, I see we've got about 15 minutes left. We're obviously not going to get to this long list of questions that, that we had dreamed up. Uh, maybe, Lord willing, in the future we can kind of come back and, and revisit those. But I, I want to begin with, a, with a, a question that's just straightforward. When was the book of Revelation written? <laughs> well... Of course, the question is really important uh, with regard to the Preterist interpretation of the book of Revelation. The Preterist interpretation requires that it be written before the destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh, I, I very much doubt that it was. Uh, I, I rather uh, think that there's, uh, uh, in terms of the tradition of the church, there's good reason to think that it was written in uh, the Mid, mid or late 90s of the first just century by the Apostle John. But here's the bottom line. Uh, for my a redemptive historical moder modified idealist interpretation of the book of Revelation, I had to come up with that terminology once for a symposium. Uh, well, for, for my interpretation, it doesn't matter. 
if it was written before 80s uh the destruction of jerusalem uh it 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 is not uh, it doesn't undermine my interpretation uh but if it was written in the 90s of course it absolutely destroys the preterist interpretation of the book and uh and and i, I certainly do think that the preterist interpretation of the book of Revelation is is wrong and can be shown to be wrong in a number of ways. Yeah, so what what advice would you give to uh, maybe the, the new student to eschatology, maybe the, the single mom who's who's just having a hard time, you know, putting food on the table and finding time to sit down and, and <laughs> study scripture? Um, when she comes to the book of Revelation, what is it you mentioned the, the importance of having a proper her, hermeneutic approach to our study of scripture what's the proper hermeneutic in our study of revelation uh the proper herm hermeneutic takes into account what rc Paul, uh, and, uh the uh literary genre of the book all interpretation of the bible everywhere uh must do genre analysis must interpret and i you know i still don't understand our dispensational brothers who, who want to say that we've got to take everything literally and we even have to take figurative language literally i don't know what they mean by that stuff i really don't it makes no no sense to me if it's figurative language it has to be interpreted figuratively if it's if it's narrative, it has to be interpreted narratively. If it's prosaic language, prosaically. And if it's apocalyptic language, which the mass, not exclusively, without exception, but the mass of the book of Revelation is, it must be interpreted apocalyptically. Uh, but of course, there are other issues here, hermeneutically. Uh, do we adopt the preterist interpretation, which says that the whole thing is fulfilled be by the destruction of Jerusalem, or most of it's fulfilled by then? Um, I, uh, uh, I mean, I think there are big problems with saying that. I think the whole book reaches out to the end of the gospel age and what I, and, uh, and there are the same problems with futurism and there are problems with the historicism that took it as a consecutive symbolic chronolo chronological history of the, of the present age. And, uh, um, you know, the old historicist interpretations of even some wonderful men like Thomas Goodwin, uh, who took the book in a historicist way and just I thought it recounted consecutively the history of this age. Just go read it and you'll see it was just massively, massively wrong. So, but I think there's another alternative and it's the alternative that I think is exemplified by G.K. Beale. And, uh, and especially we're, if we're going to talk about this young mother, uh, the most readable uh, interpretation and best, and I think uh, consistent with Beale's massive works and immensely scholarly works, is William Hendricks's uh, More Than Conquerors. If you really want to know what the book says, you want a book that you can read and understand, go get William Hendrickson's More Than Conquerors. I mean, I prize all his commentaries. I really do. If I have to go check on something it's he's one of the first two or three guys i pull off my shelf i want to know what hendrickson said about it um and and what i like about him is that he's theological and exegetical at the same time um i, I get so tired of of reading uh, these uh, deep theological <laughs> deep deep exegetical commentaries that are just terribly wrong theologically and have no good sense theologically so uh, I think Hendrickson brings those two kind of things together. He brings the exegetical and the theological uh, together in his commentaries, and I think that's crucial. So get William Hendrickson to read More Than Conquerors, and uh, he'll he'll uh, walk you through what I call the redemptive historical modified idealist interpretation of the Book of Revelation. <laughs> yeah, that's a great a great suggestion. I I have that uh, work by Hendrickson, and it is rather helpful in that work you will find uh this idea of recapitulation and so going back to that that single mother or the new student to eschatology can you define quickly for us what recapitulation is and perhaps give us a couple examples of um, yeah. how we see that play out in revelation yeah it's um uh, it's uh recapitulation refers is the opposite of the assumption of both futurist historicist 
uh, interpreters that the book of Revelation is is uh, consecutive, chronological, the symbolic history of the world. That is, every vision uh, depicts uh, what's happening in world history. The next vision, uh, it depicts what will happen next in world history. And, uh, and that whole point of view, whether it's preterist, futurist, whatever, historicist, is entirely and completely wrong. Why? Because the book of Revelation uh, exhibits recapitulation. It is recapitulatory. Uh, and and how does it do that? Well, uh, I think uh, the most evident manifestation of that comes in, in, uh, in the comparison of Revelation 11 and 12. I'm just going to summarize it for the sake of our time here. But Revelation 11 brings you right up after the seventh trumpet uh, to the end of the age. It says the judgment has come. The time for the nations to be judged uh, has, has come. And it brings you right up to the final judgment and talks about the final judgment. But what happens next? Revelation 12 is, is, a, is a depiction of, uh, in symbolic language, of the birth of the Messiah, of his incarnation, of his of his ascension to heaven. It's really clear. Uh, I think uh, a beginning student of the scripture, he reads Revelation 12, will say, well, that's talking about Jesus, and he's talking about his being born. He's talking about his ascending to heaven after his, after his cross. And so what do you have here? Uh, is, is the book of Revelation consecutive chronological history? Well, uh, that means that there was a general judgment, and then after that, Jesus was born, and that, come on, it's not that. So it's uh, it's clear that uh, that uh, you have recapitulation. After getting to the seventh trumpet, and to the judgment, at the end of the age, uh, John goes back to the beginning and talks about the beginning of the age again. Why is that so important? Because that same kind of recapitulation happens between Revelation 19 and 20. Revelation 19 gives you this um, a rider on a white horse with many crowns. It's a depiction, as most commentators believe, of the second coming of Christ. And after that, then you have the depiction of the millennium. Does that mean the millennium comes after the second coming of Christ? Not necessarily. Uh, because in the language of the of Satan being bound and cast into a pit. If you interpret that language contextually in light of the parallel passages in the in the Bible that speak of the binding of Satan, uh, that binding of Satan took place at Christ's first advent. And so Revelation 19 takes you up to the second coming. The binding of Satan takes you back to the beginning of the age. And and so you it's really important to understand the recapitulatory character of the book of Revelation. Amen. That is, that is helpful. Dr. Waldron, we're running out of time. I think we've got about seven to 10 minutes left. I've still got to ask you about the first resurrection in Revelation 20 verses <laughs> 6. I want to ask you about Daniel and why he was told to uh, bind up his revelation, but John was told not to. And, uh, but I don't want to hog your time, so I'm going to hand it over to my brother, Ryan. I think he's got a question <laughs> for you to, to end with. Uh, well, I guess we'll end with this. Um, and, I and you know, when we talk about worship, Dr. Waldron, you know, uh, I, I think John 4 uh, can be very helpful for us. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about worshiping in spirit and in truth, yeah, how does that uh, how does that affect our eschatology? Well, um, that phrase "worship in spirit and truth" is really deep. You know, one of the characteristics of John's writings is that they're so simple and so profound at the same time. Um, because I think when he says that we must worship in spirit and truth there, he actually actually includes three things in that language. We must worship um, we must worship with our hearts spiritually involved. We must worship with our uh, with our minds in, according to truth. But the language of spirit and truth also says 
also picks up on the fact that we must worship in light of the realities that have come into the world with Jesus Christ. The law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So um, it affects our eschatology this way. Well, we have to we have to understand that there is a, um, an, an important distinction, a contrast between Old Testament worship and New Testament worship. Um, uh, in the day is coming, says Jesus, when neither on this mountain, uh, neither on the mountain of Samaria, nor on this mountain, Jerusalem, we worship of God, but those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So I think our worship has to be presented to God uh, consciously and in light of the uh, work of Christ and the coming of the new covenant. And we have to worship God uh, uh, looking back on what Christ has done in his first coming and uh, looking forward to uh, his second coming. And of course, the Lord's table is the perfect epitome of that. It looks, it, we remember what he did until he come. And uh, so it looks both backward and forward. And I think it, it uh, epitomizes for us the fact that we we live uh, between the advents. We live uh, uh, during the uh, uh, overlapping of the ages. Uh, we live in this age, uh, but we also live in light of the realities of the age to come. And so I think it points us in that direction in terms of our worship being permeated by the great realities of what have happened in the first phase of the coming of the kingdom, what is going to happen in the second phase of the coming of the kingdom. Yeah, and if, if I can just give a side plug, uh, if if someone has not read Dr. Waldron's uh, book on the regulative principle um, of worship, uh, very, very helpful. So thank you. Oh yeah, brother. I my, my heart is in uh, the the book. How then should we worship? That was recently published and contains that teaching, which is in several other booklets. It's uh, it's crucial that we learn to worship God aright. It's the greatest testimony we can give to His truth in many respects. And if I Amen. recall, Doctor Waldron, that was the theme of last year's CovCon conference. How then should we worship? Wasn't it? That's right. Absolutely, brother. And the, in CovCon 2022, the inaugural uh, conference was on missions and church planning. You had Paul Washer there. At, I was there for that. That was a blessing. You had Conrad and Bayway with a number of other wonderful speakers. Can you tell us briefly, as we're running out of time here, can you tell us briefly how the decision was made to um, go with the topic of conquering and to conquer an eschatology of victory for this year's conference? Yeah. <clears throat> hmm. Well, uh, we're 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 con com committed at the seminary to covenantalism, and without saying that that some premillennialists and uh, some postmillennialists are are covenantal, uh, we are really committed to the fact that uh, uh, that an amillennial outlook uh, can be optimistic and can avoid. Uh, the uh, pitfalls of both premillennialism and postmillennialism. There are, there are. Uh, part of this is is a desire to lift our voice and say, uh, "Oh, we don't have to be postmillennial uh, to be uh, to be covenantal. We don't have to. We don't have to be theonomic to be or 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 go in the direction of Christian nationalism." And and really, there there is a connection between our, our eschatology and uh, our our doctrine of last things and our political theology, and and so we think that uh, to get the one right will help us get the other right as well. Amen. Thank you for that, Doctor Walter. And if you are looking for more information on the CuffCon conference coming up in the spring of twenty four, please go to CBTS Seminary. Dot org. That's cbtseminary.org. Well, I believe we have reached our time limit. Again, I've, I've got a little bit of frustration myself because I, I chewed off more than I could bite. I have so many more <laughs> that I, I want to get to and, and topics that we want to discuss with you, Dr. Waldron. 
perhaps in the Lord willing, um, he, he will afford us an opportunity to, to revisit this in the, in the future. But again, we want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Ryan, I thank you for your time. Dr. Waldron, would you mind closing us in a word of prayer? Father, well, we ask that you'd breathe upon your truth. Uh, we thank you for the old hymn that tells us the spirit breathes upon the word and brings the truth to light. Do that uh, for our humble attempts to articulate what your word teaches. We ask that you would bless it to every listener. And we ask you to you'd, uh, receive our thanksgiving for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Seated here at my right hand.